These ruined walls in Quebec City are the broken bones of one of North America's earliest settlements. This is Fort St. Louis, a building born of necessity, consumed in fire and cast aside by neglect. In its upper floors, Canada's history was decided. This is a rare glimpse at a landmark because by the time you see this, it will be buried underground again. It was dug up to go on public display for one summer only, 2008, the summer Quebec City turns 400. Scarred and shaped by fire and war, this building is a lost first step in a violent story that can be read in stone as you walk around this picture-pretty capital of La Belle Province, Quebec. Quebec City. Once this was the illustrious capital of New France in North America, until the British came and conquered. The seat of power for the French and then the British was right here in this newly excavated building. It was built in 1620 by Samuel de Champlain when the area was little more than just trees and rocks. Robert Gauvin is the archaeologist who gets to put the pieces of this historically rich puzzle together. This place was very exciting in, in the history of Canada because uh, it was the, the residence of the 32 of the 40 governor general of the colony under the French regime, then the British regime. In three years of digging, archaeologists found more than a half a million artifacts. We have object dating from the time of Champlain up to the time of the destruction of the chateau 200 years later, so it was very exciting. At first it was a fortification with a dwelling inside. The purpose was to protect the population. If they had an attack, the population can go inside the fort for their protection. But as the city grew and the French built its fortifications, the fort became less important. Fort Saint-Louis became Chateau Saint-Louis until it burnt down in 1834. During the dig, we found some clues that indicated that there was a fire, some uh, layers of uh, soil, very black, some uh, artifact burned, but not as much as we expected. So here we are in the kitchen built in 1723 by the governor of Vaudreuil. And we can see here a huge fireplace built by the French, but modified by the British at the beginning of the 19th century. So it was a very uh, special element that we found in the basement. The artifacts they found came from all over the chateau, especially in the old washrooms. The latrines was at that time used for the toilet and also as a domestic dump. So in the, the latrine pits, we uh, used to find a lot of uh, artifacts because when someone uh, broke an object, he threw it in the latrine. We found many uh, plates in uh, what we call creamware. It was a kind of ceramic invented by uh, Wedgwood. So Wedgwood was the uh, inventor of the, the, the modern ceramic. Today, these plates have a, a great value, but at the time, the governor threw it in the latrine. So by the analysis of the artifact, we can have a, an idea of the, the way of living of the governors and the, the 
what they liked, what they didn't like. And uh, we also found a lot of bones. At first, Champlain probably brought his own goods, but he also uh, hunt wild birds and uh, things like that to survive. But uh, during the British regime, the development of the colony was not the same thing as the Champlain, so they had cattle and pigs and uh, different kind of meat that they, uh, they can have at their stables. These artifacts will eventually make it into a museum. But here at the site, these workers are getting it ready for its big unveiling. The public will soon get a rare chance to see this history up close. This is a special year for Quebec City. 2008 is Quebec's 400th birthday, and the largest winter carnival in the world kicked off the year's monumental celebrations. Every year, the carnival has an important role, but this year it's very special because uh, uh, it's the 400th anniversary and we can feel the ambience. Quebecers want to celebrate this anniversary. That's also why carnival organizers chose to erect this ice palace in honor of the historic celebrations in this architecturally diverse city. Every year the design is different. This ice palace is a recreation of the Chateau de Pau in France. Chateau de Pau in France was the chateau where Henry IV uh, was born. And uh, Henry IV was the king who discussed with uh, Champlain to uh, help, him, help him to develop the Nouvelle France. And that's why we recreate the Chateau de Pau in Quebec City this year, because the 400th anniversary. Quebec City is the capital of the province of Quebec. It's a quaint tourist town with the most photographed hotel in the world. It also boasts a beautiful walled-in section that looks like it was stolen from Europe and lovingly nestled in the middle of the city. It is fortified because it was under constant threat of attack. It's made of stone because of constant threat of fire. Very little of what you see around here today dates back to the early days of the French regime because Mother Nature and man have rained down destruction on this city for 400 years. But residents of New France and later of British North America and then of Canada kept building it back up again. Each time they did, they left a mark of another generation. By simply looking at the buildings, you can read the fascinating story of Quebec's history and how people lived. David Mandel is an architectural historian and cultural guide. Every single corner, every spot has a meaning behind it. There's a, there's a history behind it. I know, having studied it all these years, how things have evolved, what events have taken place here. Many of the events are very dramatic. The military history and everything, the sieges that have taken place in the city. In the fall of 1985, the United Nations recognized the city's uniqueness and designated it a World Heritage Site. When they're choosing a World Heritage Site, uh, it has to be a place which is of significance, not only locally but, or even nationally, but of international significance. If it were lost, it would be a loss to the world as a whole. And so it's the, it's the North American context in which we find this city. Yes, there are walled cities in Europe uh, with uh, a wealth of architecture, but in the North American context, it's extremely rare. I've been everywhere in Canada, and this is still one of the nicest cities that we have with all the architectural and everything's pretty well intact, and people keep everything the way it is. It's whole, it has a lot of history. The people are nice, the people are friendly, it's gorgeous, it's fun to walk around, there's tons of things to see. I really feel like being in Europe. 
like you know being in France or in London so different very different places than Toronto for example or Montreal here in Canada it takes you back through history you see modern architecture and then in the midst of old old city and uh, the tradition is wonderful and just the whole atmosphere is nice <laughs> It all started when Samuel de Champlain set sail from France in a boat like this and landed in Quebec in 1608. This gentleman is entering his boat in this year's Quebec Carnival snow sculpture competition. This is a, a boat uh, from the, the people that uh, colonized all the America, especially Quebec, for, for uh, 400 years ago. It's white as a ghost, old as us. And uh, it's an honor from us to remember Souvenir de Québec. <laughs> when Samuel de Champlain arrived at the site, he observed very specific advantages. The narrowness of the river. Narrow enough that you could set up cannons on the cliffs and stop enemy ships from going beyond this point, or at least hope to stop them. He was hoping to find a route to China. And if it had turned out that the St. Lawrence had been that route, well, then this could have been a very important control point where the French could have made a lot of money controlling access to trade with China through this area. Another tremendous advantage is the steep cliffs uh, of, of this promontory. Uh, it's like a rocky point jutting out into the water like the prow of a ship with water on all sides but one. And if you could just build a fortification wall on the western side, you could create an almost impregnable fortress. And another advantage is that there are rivers which all come together at this point so that the native peoples were using those rivers to come here to fish and trade on this site. So when Champlain arrived here, all he had to do was make agreements with those native peoples to have permission to be here and to work with them in, in trade patterns that they already had established to uh, get involved in the fur trade in a place where trade was already going on. So it had many advantages for him. Champlain and his men settled at the base of the cliffs in an area that later became known as Lower Town. Their first task was to build a habitation where they could live and do business. It's not around anymore, but underneath the snow you can still see remnants of its replacement disappearing into this church's foundation. We're standing right on the site where Samuel de Champlain built his first habitation. Uh, it, it was made of wood. Uh, it was built uh, as a first shelter for Champlain's men. Uh, it had a moat around it. It, was, it had defensive positions for cannons. Uh, so it was really crucial for Champlain and his men. From an architectural point of view, it was a fairly temporary structure. He built it in 1608. By the 1620s, he had demolished it and had replaced it with a much stronger structure made of stone. And you can see, actually, lines were showing where archaeologists dug down in 1976 and found the foundations of Champlain's second building. And we can actually see the, a photograph of the foundations as they found them at that time. Not far from the habitation, perched on top of the cliffs, Champlain lived in his no longer standing Fort St. Louis. Even today, the view up here is magnificent. But in 1682, that incredible view turned into a terrifying sight. Well, in the 1680s, there was a huge fire in the lower town. Uh, the wooden shingles flying up in the air spread the flames everywhere. Many of the houses and the second habitation, which was then only an abandoned storehouse, all went down in flames the residents of New France were faced with a harsh reality. The natural elements were threatening their ability to live here. Quebec's winters are long and cold. They needed to heat their homes, but the fire that preserved them was a persistent threat. The early inhabitants needed to adapt the buildings they lived in, or they would not survive. 
It's often windy here. If a fire started, they couldn't stop it. They didn't have organized fire department running water. And so uh, sometimes you could lose, at certain points in the history of the city, as many as 1,500 houses in a single day have been lost in fires here. It's February, the coldest month of the year in Quebec City. Every year, this ice canoe race is a major highlight of the biggest winter carnival in the world, the Quebec Carnival. Nowadays, it's a fierce competition held for fun. But like many things in this city, this race reveals a layer of Quebec's rich 400-year history. So in these days, there was no bridge and no boat during winter. So they have to, to, to cross the river to carry uh, food and things between the, the two shores. And uh, after that, it became a sport. And now we, we recreate this activity and uh, every, each year there is a competition uh, during the carnival. <laughs> This year's carnival is a special one because Quebec City is in celebration mode. 400 years ago, Samuel de Champlain landed here and founded this city. It began as a fur trading post, but soon it became the capital of New France, an empire that eventually extended all the way down to Louisiana. Battles were fought. The English came. This is where Canada's history and fate was decided. Today, this picturesque city is filled with grand architectural buildings and quaint masonry homes. It wasn't always this way. Winter was a challenge for the early inhabitants. They needed to heat their homes, but the fire they used was a constant threat. In 1682, a devastating fire swept through Quebec City's lower town, destroying everything in its path. After that, Laws were passed forcing residents to fireproof their homes by building with stone rather than wood and by inserting firewalls. These helped to prevent fires from spreading from one section to the next in densely packed areas. None of these houses in Quebec City's lower town date back to the early days of New France. They're all reconstructions of the homes that used to stand here. But in Quebec's upper town, there is one house still standing that provides a glimpse into how the early inhabitants dealt with winter. This is the oldest remaining house in the city. The part on the right-hand side dates back to the late 1600s. And notice how much steeper that right-hand side is than the section beside it. They had great difficulty heating these places. They tried heating them with open fireplaces as they had done in France, and they froze. It wasn't until the early 1700s that they started to use metal stoves, and they could be a lot more comfortable with the addition of storm windows and, and other advantages. Uh, you could start to build larger houses. If you compare the size of it, though, with the 19th century house, just to the left of it, you'll see a huge difference. By the uh, 1860s, it was much easier to keep the interiors of these buildings comfortable with improved heating uh, systems, uh, radiators, and so on. And so the scale is totally different. By the end of the 1600s, there were about 1,600 people living in the upper and lower towns. Back in those days, where you lived depended on who you were. The merchants and artisans lived in the lower town because that's where commerce was going on. The nobility and officers lived in the upper town, so that's where they built the more impressive institutional buildings. 
So in the late 1600s, major institutions were constructed here. Uh, the governor's residence, uh, the religious institutions, the Ursuline convent, the, uh, the seminary. It was meant to impress the king and to give a sense of the power of the French in North America. So even though it was a small settlement, uh, there was a, a great desire in terms of symbolism for this to be worthy of the French and their ambitions for North America. Their ambitions included spreading their culture as well as their political power. So building religious institutions became a big part of that plan. As soon as New France got a bishop, one of his first orders of business was to build a place where priests could live and train. Well, we're standing at the entrance of the Seminary of Quebec, which was founded in the 1660s originally as a community of priests. Now, if you look over the archway, you can see the letters SME which stand for Seminaire des Missions Étrangères, the Seminary for Foreign Missions, which was established in Paris in the 1660s by friends of Bishop Laval. Their objective was to spread the Catholic faith to faraway places like China and North America. And so this is exactly what they did. So this became the center of a vast Catholic network in North America. Now this is one of the major architectural attractions in Quebec City. So here in the courtyard of the seminary, you'd think you're no longer in North America as if we were in France. This is the oldest wing uh, of the seminary dating back to the 1670s. These wings were rebuilt in the uh, early 19th century, 1820s. Today these buildings are no longer used uh, as part of the seminary, although the priests are in other buildings not too far from here. Uh, the School of Architecture now uh, occupies these buildings. They've been beautifully restored, but in a way so that you can't really see the changes that have been made. Architecture students, many of them have studios in the roof area uh, up above, which has a very impressive visible roof structure. Originally that was the um, dormitory which was affectionately known in the past as La Sibérie, Siberia, because you froze up there. This old seminary has all the characteristics of buildings from the early days of New France. Not only does it have steep roofs so the snow slides off more easily and firewalls projecting up to the roofs from the basement, but also the whitewash mortar look covering the outer walls that too had a practical purpose. The type of stone which they used in the early days was vulnerable to water infiltration. So if the water got in between stones, froze, it would expand and break the walls open. So to stop this from happening, they covered it with this whitewashed mortar, which they, they found was attractive if it was painted white. Residents of New France thought the rough stone look was primitive and ugly. So the idea of the design of this is that you have beautifully cut stone around the windows and the doors, and then the rough stone is covered with a smooth whitewashed mortar to set off that nicely cut stone. So that's part of the aesthetic of New France. No matter the season, that aesthetic retains its charm all year round. If this is where the priests trained, then not far from here in Quebec's upper town is where many of the commoners and nobility worshipped. Not only is this the mother of all Catholic churches in Quebec and Canada, but for the United States as well. This is Notre Dame de Quebec. It began as a small parish church in the 1640s, but Bishop Laval, the first bishop of New France, made this church into his cathedral. And it was from here that he spread the Catholic faith across the continent, beginning in the St. Lawrence Valley here, building churches all through the heart of New France. But his diocese actually extended over much of what is now Canada and the United States. So it, the, the Catholic faith with missions from here, from the church and the seminary here, uh, extended all the way down the Mississippi River and eventually as far west almost as the Rocky Mountains. As well as being the bishop's basilica, this was also the people's church. Notre Dame de Quebec has taken many hard knocks over the years. Cannon fire, natural fire, and an unstable base have affected the building you see today. There are actually numerous influences that are visible in this building because its history is quite complex. And 
as we visit this church, we can see the, the, the evolution of Quebec architecture over the generations. For example, if we look at the facade, it was designed by uh, Thomas Bayerger in the 1840s, but his intention was to have a completely symmetrical facade with two towers which would be identical. He started building the tower on the left-hand side, but realized that the foundations were not adequate. They were not strong enough to build a tower of the type that he wanted, and so he had to stop three quarters of the way up. And as a result, we end up with the other tower on the right-hand side being more in the form that had originally been in the French regime, and we end up with an asymmetrical facade. To make it more complicated, after the fire of 1922, that tower on the right was reconstructed and has a slightly different shape from the one that it originally had. The fire of 1922 ravaged this church, especially the interior. The most spectacular aspect of the church is the magnificent baldacchino, this great golden canopy over the altar. Now, this and all of the ornamentation in the church was lost in the fire of 1922. Just the stone walls remained standing. So all of this had to be reconstructed. Fortunately, artisans and architects who had been working on completing the decor of the church had taken a lot of photographs before the fire. And using those photographs, a model which was made as well, and the original drawings by François Bayerger, they decided to reproduce this great golden canopy as well as the rest of the interior. So that maquette was sent to Paris, and an, an, an artist named André Vermar reproduced it, this time in plaster with a metal armature inside. That was sent back in pieces by ship and then assembled in the church and covered with gold leaf. So they, the people of this church were willing to go to almost any effort to replace what they had lost in the fire. By far the most pressing destructive force that loomed over the city in the days of New France was the threat of a British invasion. The English wanted control over the fur trade. Since the capital of New France was strategically located at the mouth of the mighty St. Lawrence River, if the English wanted control over the fur trade, they'd have to take control of Quebec first. Yvon Deloge is a historian who specializes in Quebec and its fortifications. If Quebec fell, then the whole colony would fall uh, because there would be no reinforcements coming in to either Montreal or to Trier Evers or, or on the Great Lakes for that matter. Uh, Quebec was the major st station for uh, reinforcements and for the export of the colony. So, the economy would collapse, military uh, reinforcements couldn't be available, the colony was just, would just be ruined. 12 the English tried to invade Quebec, and twice they failed. The French's growing confidence can be seen in this restored, historically significant church in Quebec's lower town. Well, this is one of the first churches in the history of the city. It was the main church uh, of the lower town for a long time. And originally it was called L'Église de l'Enfant Jésus, or the Church of the Christ Child. But after two victories over the English in 1690 and 1711, the name was changed twice. First to Our Lady of the Victory, and then Our Lady of the Victories, Notre Dame des Victoires. The tabernacle is in the form of a fortress with towers and turrets and two angels standing on the towers holding flags indicating the dates of the two victories over the English. And so the French, of course, interpreted this as being a miraculous intervention on their behalf. Even so, the French weren't completely overconfident. 
they tried to fortify the, uh, the upper town because they were sure that the British would lay siege to the city. Otherwise, uh, they lacked a sufficient number of soldiers. They couldn't be prepared for what the British were decided to put up against the city. No one would have been prepared for that. The French thought they were safe in their naming of this church. Little did they know, but New France was about to enter into its darkest days yet. The name Notre Dame des Victoires reflects very well the situation for a long time because the French were victorious despite all odds for a long time. But the end was going to come for New France in 1759 with the arrival of a huge English fleet. Quebec City is the capital of the province of Quebec in Canada. It's celebrating its 400th anniversary in 2008, a history that lies in plain sight in the city's architecture. The beautifully restored buildings and homes have been burnt, besieged, and built back up again. Canada's history was decided here and is now left for all to see. For close to a century and a half, this was the capital of New France, a vast empire that stretched all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. In the summer of 1759, that was all about to change. the British were getting ready to launch a massive attack on Canada. Control over much of the North American fur trade was at stake. Quebec was the key to the French supply system and the neck of the bottle. If the English could only capture it, all would be theirs. Uh, when the British came over with Wolfe and all his soldiers, we're talking about something like 29,000 men the French could muster at the most 18 to 19,000. So the odds were very imbalanced. Suspecting an attack on either his camp downriver from Quebec in Beauport or on the city, the French general Montcalm built up his defenses. Where the steep cliffs, river, and fortified walls didn't already protect the city, the artillery batteries and warships did. During the siege of 1759, the English established their cannons on the cliffs on the other side of the river, and from there fired thousands of its, of its century bombs or fire bombs into the city. And one of the most vulnerable areas was the lower town. The deadly siege carried on for nearly two months. The city was nearly all demolished. The most usual numbers you see when you look up uh, literature on this subject is something like 40,000 shells dropped being dropped on the city, which meant that the Chateau Saint-Louis and all the buildings facing the river uh, would have been destroyed. Still, Quebec's defenses held. Time and options were running out for the invader. General Wolfe knew that soon the water would freeze and they would be stuck. He needed a different approach. He was wondering where he would lead his attack from, and uh, his counselors advised him that uh, he should take into consideration the fact that to go upriver and then land and surprise the French, 
Uh, he wasn't sure about the, the, the strategy or the tactics, but he did so. One night in September, Wolf and his fleet used the cover of darkness to sneak into position. They landed upriver and climbed laboriously up the hill to the Plains of Abraham. He came up the cliff and he had about 4,500 of his soldiers up on the heights of Abraham. And Morcam, seeing that, had been notified of this. He just rushed from Bhopal and had his troops over. Uh, and the amount of uh, French soldiers and English soldiers were about the equivalent. They were about 4,500 facing one another. And the only difference being that the uh, soldiers on the English side were professional soldiers, whereas a number of the uh, French uh, soldiers were militiamen, and they were undisciplined. So after a first volley, it was all over with. Both generals died on the heights, of course, this is well known. But the French just retreated in, within the city. Uh, and after five days, decided just to cease operations and surrender. The face of the city would never be the same again. The city was a smoking ruin and desperately needed a restoration. There were hardly any British craftsmen here to speak of, and so the city was rebuilt by local craftsmen almost as it had been before the English had conquered the city. So while the British were in power, there was nothing really to symbolize their presence here. It's only really after the American Revolution and after Quebec becomes capital of British North America in the late 1700s and early 1800s that the British start to build official buildings which symbolize their presence. This Anglican cathedral was one of the first official buildings the British built in Quebec City. We're now standing in front of the Cathedral of the Holy Trinity. It's the first Anglican cathedral to have been built outside the British Isles. Until it opened its doors in 1804, English parishioners had no choice but to use the already existing Catholic establishments for their Sunday services. The majority of the population was Catholic. There was a Catholic cathedral just around the corner, basically. So the English wanted to have an expression of their presence here and of their religion. The British military engineers who designed it were highly influenced by Renaissance architecture, with their use of symmetry and proportions. They took the basic proportions of the church from St. Martin in the Fields in London, the great church on Trafalgar Square. The church in London has an impressive portico with large columns in front. But here in the colonial context, they had to simplify it somewhat. Here they couldn't extract stones large enough uh, for the state of the quarries at the time to, uh, to make columns like that. And so they compromised and placed flat columns called pilasters, which we can see on the facade here. Something else that's very interesting is the shape of the pediment, that triangular form beneath the roof line. If you think back to the temples of ancient Greece and Rome or neoclassical banks here in North America, you might realize that the pediment doesn't have quite the right shape to follow the strict rules of classical architecture. The slopes are much higher and steeper than they normally would be. The interesting thing is that when the church was first built, the pediment had the right shape, but they had so much trouble with snow accumulation and water infiltration that they decided to follow the local French tr tradition and build a much steeper, higher roof right over the old one. And they raised the front and back walls to meet it. So this is a good example of how a great model from the city of London had to be modified in the colonial context. In many ways, this is the oldest and most authentic church interior that has survived in this old city. One very significant part of the church is the bishop's throne. And if you look above it, you can see the coat of arms of the Diocese of Quebec. At the very top, we can see the bishop's mitre, and then the shield is divided into two parts, blue and red, with a wavy line between the two, symbolizing the ocean which separates Canada from the mother country, England. And in the lower part, you can see the British lion, uh, a golden lion holding a key, symbolizing the confidence between the crown and the church, the church and the crown.
Once the British built their religious representation here in Quebec, their next task, many years later, was to address a growing threat at their doorstep, the Americans. This is the citadel of Quebec, which was constructed between 1820 and 1831 by the British military. Uh, the um, city had been attacked by the Americans in 1775, and following the next war between Great Britain and the United States, the War of 1812, the Duke of Wellington ordered that this great fortress be constructed. The British were worried they might lose their territory to the Americans. So after they avoided the War of 1812 in Quebec City, they invested massively in defending Canada. Today, this citadel is a military base. But back then, this fortress was going to be a big part of the British's imperial defense of the colony. The English constructed it up on the cliff, right next to the western fortification wall the French had previously built. To understand this fortress, we need to really see it from above. So if you can imagine, if we were looking down on it from the air, we would look down on a great star-shaped fortress with layers of defense. Right now, we are standing on the outer layer of that fortress, which is the glassy earth piled up in front of the walls to hide them from direct cannon fire. The next layer is right beside us, a ditch which goes down about 10 meters. Uh, the enemy would have to go down into that ditch with ladders. Uh, once they were in that ditch, wherever they turned, they would face at least one cannon. Every angle of that star-shaped fortress has at least one cannon covering it. In certain cases, as many as six cannons, three on each side, cover, for example, the main gate of the fortress. Each layer within the fortress is higher than the layer in front of it. So the, if enemy forces are attacking and they manage to take one layer of defense, the area further within the fortress is higher up and the defending forces can fire down on them from there. And we have these star-shaped elements and layers of defense facing not only the western side where you might expect the enemy come, to come from the Plains of Abraham, but also facing the city in case there might have been rebellion from within or if American forces managed to take the city, then the British military would have been able to withdraw into the fortification and continue to hold out from there. Where the wall is thinnest is facing the St. Lawrence River, but that makes sense because it is about 100 meters above the water. No doubt, this considerable new fortress in the capital of British North America was a major deterrent for any would-be attackers. It has never been attacked. Uh, the city was attacked many times in its history, but the last actual attack took place in 1775 when the American revolutionaries attacked long before the construction of this fortress. Everything remained peaceful in this city, even when the political situation began to change yet again, leading to the construction of Quebec's Parliament building. The impressive Parliament building of the province of Quebec was built at the end of the 1870s, early 80s. Quebec has always been a capital. It was capital of New France, and then it became capital of British North America. It was capital of the United Canadas. And then with Confederation, it became capital of the province of Quebec. And so this building was built as the Parliament of the province of Quebec. Given Quebec's long and storied past, it's no wonder its parliament building reflects a mixed parentage. It's very expressive of the combination of cultural elements which I find make Quebec City unique, this mixture of French and English influences. The very strong French influence is the dominant one, but at the same time when it was built, Quebec was part of the British Empire, and so it's filled with symbols of the British as well. The overall design of the building is largely inspired by the Louvre with the box-shaped mansard roofs, but the central tower makes us think of the British parliamentary system, it makes us think of Big Ben in London, and this reflects the fact that it's the British parliamentary system going on inside, even though the debates are going on in French. The statues in the front tell the fascinating story of this city. The facade uh, has been described as a kind of altar to the history of Quebec and of New France. And uh, If we look at the entrance, we can see native peoples, the first inhabitants of New France, in front of the entrance door, and there's a native fisherman by the fountain below that. And right above the native fisherman is the 
coat of arms of the province of Quebec, under which is written, Je me souviens, I remember my history. And just above that, to the left, General Wolfe pointing. His adversary, the Marquis de Montcalm, is on the right. And then to the left of the tower, we see Governor Frontenac pointing to a cannon. This refers to the famous incident when an English emissary asked the city to surrender, and he said that I will answer your general with the mouths of my cannons and the shots of my muskets. Above him, with the golden cross, is Bishop Laval, the first bishop of New France. Above him, Samuel de Champlain, the founder of Quebec. And there are other great figures from the history of Quebec and of New France, the great explorers, uh, military figures, and so on. After nearly three centuries of French, then English rule with each dominant party leaving its own architectural mark, this fortified city was about to enter a new architecturally romantic era. Just as tourists were starting to flock to this city, old Quebec underwent a transformation brought on by modernization the everlasting image of this city would never be the same again. The dawn of the 20th century in Quebec City looked a lot like it does today. The tourists are out. People are at work. This city is fueled with the joie de vivre. Canada's destiny was decided here. 400 years of history in the old city's streetscapes, fortifications, and architecture. This city is unique on this continent, not only surrounded by fortification walls, but the fascinating mixture of French and English architecture spanning four centuries uh, makes it truly a, a unique and wonderful place on this continent. Peel back the layers, the city's history unfolds. The oldest layer goes back to the days of New France, with buildings meant to symbolize French power in North America. The British took over after a bloody siege that brutalized the city. Then they built their own architectural expressions. Now, this is the capital of the province of Quebec in Canada, with its emblemizing chateau-like structure casting a majestic shadow over the city. Throughout its entire history, fire has played a major role in this city's transformation. On Friday, April 4, 2008, during the city's historic 400th anniversary year, the first chateau-like building ever constructed in Quebec City went down in flames. Officials still don't know what led to the fire, but this military drill hall that was built in 1887 is now nothing but an empty shell. This building was used by the Voltigeur Militia Regiment for military exercises. So they could parade out here on this open piece of ground where we're standing in front of the building, or uh, inside as well. There's a, there was a huge open space inside where they could do military exercises. Fire leveled most of that history and is once again driving the city's evolution. Well, it is true that uh, when one recounts the history of the city of Quebec and particularly of its architecture, tragic fire after tragic fire plays an important role. And the great fires of the late 1600s, for example, which led to the creation of laws about 
how buildings were constructed, and that helped to determine what the houses of Quebec looked like for, for centuries afterwards with the firewalls and stone construction and so on. The tragic destruction of the city during the siege of 1759 with fire bombs and everything had to, be, had to be rebuilt. The cathedral, Notre Dame de Quebec, destroyed in a fire in 1922, and then how they rebuilt it completely, almost exactly as it had been before the fire. This shows how attached the people are to the heritage of their city and to what efforts they've been willing to go in the past to rebuild these buildings. And I hope that in the same spirit, this uh, magnificent structure will be reconstructed as well. This drill hall was the beginning of a new architectural era for Quebec. This is one of the earliest examples of some of the romantic castle-like structures which were built in Quebec City at the end of the 19th century, which really define our uh, view or our image of Quebec City today. For example, the new gates of the city, which were built in the 1870s, wide enough for the traffic to flow through easily, but built like medieval castles with crenellation towers and so on. Uh, this military drill hall with its round towers, and of course, the most famous of them all, the Chateau Frontenac, which was built in the 1890s in a castle-like uh, form. Well, like everyone in the city, I'm very attached to this building. And the silhouette of it, if you can go out on the water and look at it from a distance, is really, truly spectacular. The Chateau Frontenac was built very soon after Canada, the nation, was born. Tourists were already turning up in Quebec City. Canada just launched its first transcontinental railway. A castle-like hotel was exactly what the city needed. It was built for the Canadian Pacific Railway. It opened its doors in 1893. They hired an American architect, Bruce Price, to design it, and they asked him to build a castle on a cliff. It became the symbol of Quebec, and is said to be the most photographed hotel in the world. He took his inspiration from the Chateau of the Loire Valley in France, with the round towers and cone-shaped roofs, and also from Scottish baronial architecture, which is quite similar. The Chateau Frontenac was a key part of the Canadian Pacific Railway's master plan, the idea was to link England with its colonies in Asia through the railway in Canada. This hotel would be the first port for the elite visitors to stay along their journey, as well as a destination point for anyone with the means to stay here. It was largely built uh, for Americans and for members of the European elite who were coming to stay here. The elite of the city uh, would often hold events here and they would have come here for tea um, and have events uh, coming out, uh, ceremonies for their young daughters and so on. But uh, for the average person, uh, the Chateau Frontenac was a place that in the past they wouldn't have dared to come into. Today, very different, of course, everyone enters the Chateau Frontenac, but that was not always the case. With the construction of the Chateau Frontenac, the city started to modernize. Cars took the place of horses, and skyscrapers like this one started to penetrate the skies. The Price Building, which you can see behind me, caused a lot of controversy when it was first constructed because of its great height. It was built in 1929, and in fact, they laid the cornerstone the day the stock market crashed. People were not happy when this building was constructed. They didn't want to see their skyline completely transformed. In the 1920s, there were some ambitious projects for the old city. The Chateau Frontenac wanted to make a large uh, addition which would have required the demolition of some very important uh, 18th century houses. The Price Building, which we have behind us, was constructed, and there were other projects. The Depression intervened, in a sense, uh, fortunately, because these projects were put on the back burner and some of them were never uh, carried out. It wasn't until the 1950s, though, when a rather ugly 1950s box-like tower was built by the Hotel Dieu Hospital, not too far from here, that people really got upset. And this led to the creation of the historic district in 1963, so that buildings of this type would not be built in the future in the historic district. With the creation of the historic district, 100 years from now, this area in the city should look pretty much the same as it does today. There's beautification, uh, restoration of buildings, but unless there is a fire or for some other reason, the buildings around us are likely to remain. And any new structures are designed so that they will fit in in terms of scale and appropriate materials. 
That means this 18-story building will remain the one and only skyscraper in old Quebec's historic district. It's a very welcome situation for someone from my perspective because in North America, cities are constantly changing. Uh, this type of environment is so precious, the way of life that we have in this type of city where you can walk everywhere, where everything is on a human scale and where you can sense the passage of time with layers of history that we have here uh, is very rare in the North American context. And uh, it's wonderful to think that for future generations, we're going to be able to enjoy it in this, this kind of very special environment. While most of the layers of history can be seen in stone all over Old Quebec, there is one that will only be in public view for a few short months. This is the grand opening ceremony of Samuel de Champlain's Fort Saint Louis that was the place of power in the city during the early days of New France and British North America. For more than 200 years, all the political decisions, military decisions were, were taken here. So it was very uh, important for the history of the city, but for the history of the old country. It went from being a fort to a chateau to a burnt down ruin in just over two centuries. Very soon, these walls, this stove, and the memories of these open spaces will be going underground again. We want to protect the, the remains of the chateau because these walls, when they were uh, in the ground, were protected. But now, with the winter, with the rain and the freezing, it's very difficult to protect these uh, walls. So at the end of the summer, we have to fill up the site with sand to protect the, the remains, the, the stone remains. And so the city evolves. It will no doubt keep changing, but its roots will always run deep. You can feel the magic, you can feel the, the, the French roots to this city. That's what is truly amazing about it, for me at least. I'm sure Samuel de Champlain would be very surprised if he saw the city of today, uh, but he would also be very proud. He had great dreams for this city, he saw it as being a great French city on the North American continent. Uh, he might not be so pleased to know about the conquest by the British and how it all evolved uh, in the end, but I'm sure he'd be quite proud. This is an architectural hotspot that will no doubt continue to celebrate its layers of history around every corner for centuries to come.